Well, let's go ahead and get started. It is five o'clock. Appreciate you being here. Let's uh, go to God in prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for the beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you we've been able to assemble this morning, worship, remember Christ's sacrifice, and come together tonight to study your word. We pray for all the classes. Help us all to teach, Heavenly Father, only your truth. And help us we, to do it in an effective way and as students to learn and to uh, ask questions, to take in uh, what you'd have us to know. To better equip ourselves to be pleasing to you. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with uh, so many that we're concerned about, been praying for. Uh, we thank you that you spared us from the storm. And we pray for those who have experienced great devastation from it that we did not. Especially we pray, Heavenly Father, for your people. As your continued care, as you know best for us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to spend a minute to just say, uh, uh, clarify something that I said last time, which uh, uh, I'll correct, clarify or correct, I'm not sure what I said, but I thought late that night I got back on, I thought, what did I, did I say this? I didn't intend to say this. So, just to clarify, we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 36, where uh, Jeremiah has given a message from God to Baruch. Baruch goes and, and he writes it down, and it's read finally before the king, remember Jehoiakim, and he takes his knife and he cuts it out and throws it in the fire, that text. And I did not mean to, I did not mean to imply that I thought that uh, inspiration was dictation. Uh, I don't, hopefully I didn't say that or imply it, but I thought later, did I, did I imply that? I didn't mean to. Because I, I do not think that uh, the doctrine of inspiration, the process of inspiration, was dictation. Uh, so, um, just to clarify that, in case it was potential misunderstanding. Now, uh, we were here about here last time, uh, and we're going to come back to this at the very end of the class tonight, of this uh, uh, topic of uh, particularly homosexuality, sexual sin, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we were talking about that uh, this, from this, this is the last quote of the article that I mentioned, uh, there's no reason or science, there's no logic why LGBT contains the particular letters it does. It's an evolving code. And this is just a, a really good case in point, what we've said all along, that uh, once, once a standard, in our case God and his word, is disowned, then it becomes a matter of, of uh, what used to be called years ago, situation ethics. And it uh, becomes a matter of the secular culture. Uh, it's whatever they want it to be, whatever the ruling powers want it to be, whatever you want it to be. Uh, that's why it's an evolving code. Because scripture, of course, to, to the secularist and naturalist dismay, scripture does not evolve. It doesn't evolve. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but he's right. We said last time he's right. Logically, uh, there's no reason why these other aberrations should not creep their way into the alphabet. Now, I do want to take, well, next time, Lord willing, we're going to talk about what I've called scientism. Uh, and also soon, maybe then or soon, uh, somebody said recently something about the sources that I've used for this class besides scripture. So I do want to at least list them. Most of you may have no interest in that, but I will, because I've mentioned that to the person, I'll try to list those uh, quickly and talk about scientism next time. But what I want to do now is take a little bit of excursion and look at, uh, you know, we said just a few, I don't know, last time or recently, uh, we had a slide that showed how somebody was trying to dismiss Paul. You know, Paul was, a, how did he put it? Paul was a, a wonderful kindergartner, the Apostle Paul. But he was an, uh, a horrible, he was a horrible, you know, I forget what the word he used. Uh, he really didn't have anything to say for our day and age. And so view, view Paul that way. He was, he was, you know, okay for his time, but now his time is gone. And he has nothing to say that should cause us to be wedded to his teaching. So I want to take a, a little bit of an excursion and talk about, hopefully this won't bore you. Bore you. If you know this, then it may be a reminder, refresher. If you don't, then that's good. Then, then you can think about these subjects. I want to talk about the apostles just a little bit. Um, and really, 
if, if, we, if we don't understand the apostles and their, their place in the church and in the gospel and in Jesus' plan, then a lot of what we're talking about tonight we can just throw out. If, if they really don't have, if they don't have the authority that we're going to talk about just a few, for just a few minutes. Uh, because you think about it, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the rest of the New Testament is written uh, not, Jesus isn't walking and talking from John on. He's in heaven, right? So if we're just, if we're just taking the Gospels, which some would be inclined to do, uh, we got some real gaps. And uh, many, many things we do religiously, uh, individually and as a collective uh, group of disciples, is done because we find them in Acts through Revelation. So if the apostles' new office is not sufficient for us to rely on what they've said, then we're, we're adrift. Let's talk about this for just a few minutes. The apostles do, did have, and still do have, a unique one-of-a-kind office. There is, there's nobody, no position that, in a sense, approaches and certainly takes the place of the apostolic office. Um, and, of course, they being dead yet speak. The apostles, we'll talk in a minute, the apostles are still ruling through their message. Nobody's ruling for them. They're ruling through their message. Obviously, Jesus is ruling, but he delegated authority to them. Jesus prayed all night. Remember in Luke 6? He prayed all night, went up to the mountain, prayed all night. The next morning, Luke says, Jesus called the disciples and he appointed 12. And they are the ones we know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, Bartholomew, all, all 12, including Judas. The source and content of their message, first of all, Jesus' words on earth. I mean, Jesus, think about these men were with him for two and a half, three years. And they're following, and this is one of the qualifications, right? Acts 1. They had to, when they replaced Judas with Matthias, they had to have somebody who had been with them that accompanied Jesus while he was on earth. So that's one of the things that they did. But they were positioned strategically to be eyewitnesses of his majesty, everything he did. And we'll come to that again in just a few minutes, hopefully. But the content, so Jesus' word, what he said on earth to them was a source of their message. And we have, a, we have that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a time or so after that that Jesus is quoted. Remember, is it, uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, Paul who says, you remember the words of the Lord Jesus, he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's a quote of Jesus after he's gone back into heaven. But most of it is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, but also, Jesus' further words, all truth. So, uh, let's look quickly at, uh, some of these will not, will not be on the screen. I'll try to get to them and, and, and read through them as quickly. But I want you to, I want, I want us to, to be reminded, at least, of this chain of command and how essential it is when we're trying to teach somebody and understand ourselves why we do what we do. Uh, John 14. Jesus is talking to the apostles. And he said in verse 25 and verse 26, these things I've spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So here, Jesus has been teaching them things, but now he says, I'm going to ascend to heaven. And it's, it's advantageous, he said to you, that I go, even though you don't want me to go. It's good for you that I do, because if I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And he will bring to your remembrance what I've told you, and he will guide you into all truth. Look at chapter 16, a few pages over. John 16, verse uh, 12. I have many more things to say to you, Jesus said, but you cannot bear them now. But verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, initiative. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. He will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Okay? So, Jesus is talking to the apostles here. He's not talking to us in the sense that directly the Holy Spirit's going to guide us into all truth. 
He's talking the context is the apostles. The apostles are going to be receive the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. And they will be guided into all truth. And that's what we're reading now. We're reading the results of their being guided into all truth. Uh, Matthew 10, they're going to be spokesmen for Jesus. Notice, I want you to notice the, the tie that Jesus makes between himself and his apostles. It's a tie that we as Christians dare not break. Matthew 10, verse 13. Jesus said, if the house is worthy, notice in verse 1, glance at verse 1, he's talking to his 12 disciples, the apostles. Verse 13, if if the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it's not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Verse 14, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Solomon and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. See, Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out, you twelve. What you say is, is in my stead. If they don't receive you, they won't receive me. In verse 40, same chapter, he who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. These are ambassadors for Christ. These are special, unique, one-of-a-kind people. And Jesus is saying, my authority rests on you. It rests on you. And the Holy Spirit's going to see to it that you get what you need. Now, uh, what about this standing in the early church? The twelve. The twelve referred to a special group collectively of, with all the unique associations surrounding them. This is interesting to me that, that you could have a change in membership and still be the twelve. You remember in Acts 1, we referenced that already. Judas is dead, he committed suicide. Christ has ascended early in Acts 1. In Acts 1 and verse 26, they drew lots for these two disciples. The lot fell to Matthias. He was added to the 11 apostles. Okay. Judas is gone. Matthias is added. Now they got 12 again. In chapter 6 and verse 2 of Acts, so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and they said this. So the 12. The 12 is is, is kind of code. I would describe it as code for this unique group of men who could have a change in membership and still be the 12. They could be the 11 and still be called the 12. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 5. This is a case when Paul is talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And he's talking about early in that chapter, he's talking about the sequence that Jesus appeared to certain people. And he said in uh, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, and that, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Okay. Now, what I'm making a point here about this, it could be eleven and still be called the twelve. If I'm, if I'm getting the sequence right here, this is when Jesus was raised from the dead. He appeared to different people. He appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. Okay. This is after Judas, if I've got it right. This is after Judas has already killed himself. He's gone. He's out of the picture. Matthias has not been added yet. So they're 11. But Paul said he appeared to the 12. I'm saying this just to say again, you could have a change in membership, you could have a change in number, a little bitty change in number, 11 or 12. And they're still called the 12 because I think it was code basically. Code for when you say the 12, people know what you're talking about. You're talking about this select, unique, one of a kind, group. Peter, James, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, and so forth. Matthias added later, Judas is gone, and then of course later Paul, who claimed all the standing and qualifications of apostleship. But the twelve, just again to make this just echoes again, they are unique. They're unique and they were intended to be unique. Paul was not one of the twelve, but still a full-fledged apostle. You know, Paul said Kind of like Jeremiah. Paul said he had been called by God, remember what he said? From his mother's womb. So he was aware of his late arrival. He said in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, he said, Christ appeared to me last of all as to one untimely born. For I'm the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He makes that statement. But then he goes in other places and Paul has to defend his apostleship. And he's going to say, he says, you know, uh, 
in these next verses, he's going to say, yeah, I'm not fit to be called an apostle, but I am. And really, there's a sense in which I'm not one whit behind the chiefest apostles. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 2. Again, remember, a lot of our New Testament is written by Paul. If he doesn't have the authority delegated to him by Christ, then we're in trouble. Verse 1 and 2, am I not free, he said? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are my, the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He says, I'm an apostle. I've seen the Lord. And you Corinthians are a seal of my apostleship. You came to exist. I'm, I've had part in your existence. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Again, we're trying to go through this quickly. I may skip some of this because I want to get through this, this tonight. But 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. Look at chapter 12, the next chapter, 11 and 13. I have become foolish. You yourselves compel me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. See, we just read, Paul said, I'm not fit to be called an apostle, but I am, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And because I am, I'm not one whit behind anybody else. I'm not, I'm not behind the 12. I'm not one of the 12, but I'm not a whit behind them because of what Jesus has done and selected me for this role. In uh, chapter 13, verse 10, for this reason I am writing these things while absent, so that when present I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and for not tearing down. We're going to come to this idea in just a few minutes again, but notice Paul's language. I'm writing these, I'm not there, I'm writing these things to you so that when I come personally, I will not have to use severity. What, what's he hinting at here? Who has the right to use severity? Well, I'll tell you who does, an apostle of Jesus Christ does. Absolutely. Uh, and then I'm not going to read 1 Corinthians 4. Great passage, he talks about he and the apostles had followed Christ into intense rejection and suffering. He talks about what they'd gone through. He and the apostles, the other apostles. Now, you recall Matthew 16, Peter has just confessed Jesus. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Flesh and blood didn't tell you this. God told you this. And I say to you, you're Peter. On this rock, I'll build my church. The grace of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you loose shall be loose. Whatever you bind shall be bound. And, uh, and so, but later on in about chapter 18, I think, he, he says this pretty much to all the apostles. Uh, but on Pentecost, we know in Acts 2 and in Acts 10 with Cornelius, Peter did use keys of the gospel, so to speak, in preaching the first gospel sermon to the Jews after Christ's resurrection and to the Gentiles in Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. They had some, they had authority under the Holy Spirit's influence. Matthew 19, Matthew 19, uh, Peter, as he often did, you know, Peter, Peter said, uh, Lord, we've left everything and followed you. What shall we get? What's in it for us? And in, uh, in that passage, Jesus said, well, let me just turn and read it quickly. Uh, this, this again shows the unique role of the apostles. In uh, Matthew 19, let me get to that. Matthew 19, verse uh, 27. Peter said, we've left everything, followed you. What shall there be for us? Jesus said, verse 28, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Of course, this is often taken to mean at the millennium, or you know, when Jesus comes back and reigns on earth on his throne in, in Jerusalem, and uh, the 12 apostles will reign on thrones helping him. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. I think he's talking about right now. 
the apostles sit on 12 thrones. In what sense? Well, if I'm correct about this, and I could be wrong, he's talking about what we've got right here. We've just said that, the New Testament. The apostles are ruling and judging now through the word that the Holy Spirit gave them, which Jesus said which he would send to guide them into all truth. They're judging right now. They originally judged in person. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's talking about the man who had his father's wife, and Paul said, why are you putting up with this, uh, this immorality? In verse uh, 3, he said, for my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit. Notice now, Paul said, I'm not there, but I know what's going on, and, I, and I'm present in spirit, and I've already judged him. I've already judged him who has, so, who has so committed this as though I were present. And then he says, here's what you do. You withdraw yourself from that person. Again, we'll get into this a little bit more in just a few minutes, but this, this is an apostle talking. He's giving commands. He's giving orders. He said, I'm... I'm way over here, but I've judged him already. I've judged him. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, just a few pages over, verse 28, Paul said, uh, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mir miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Are, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? They don't have gifts of healing, do they? Can all speak with tongues? They don't interpret, do they? But he said, desire the best gifts. And in chapter 13, he's going to talk about love. But the point I'm making here is, he said, God is appointing in the church first apostles. First apostles. And in Ephesians 2, verse 20, he said, Christians have been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, you see what the New Testament says, and Jesus said about his apostles, these 12, and Paul, <laughs> they're unique. Jesus gave them authority, delegated authority. They were speaking what he wanted spoken. They were teaching what he wanted taught through the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 4 of Ephesians and verse 1, he gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, Paul's talking in, in chapter 3 of Ephesians about the, a mystery. He said it's a mystery. And he, he, he defines what the mystery was. The mystery in Ephesians 3 is that was hidden from generations. The mystery was that God was going to bring the Gentiles into his people. He was going to accept the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles too. It was a mystery. It was hidden in ages past. And Paul said, in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. This mystery that was hidden, the apostles made it known. And we're reading about it in Ephesians 3 and throughout the New Testament. The Gentiles, even Jesus hinted at this. You know, I have other sheep in John, he said, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. I've got to get them. He's talking about the Gentiles. It was always God's plan, but people couldn't see it, but it was revealed by the holy apostles. Revelation 21, toward the very end of that book, the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. Look at this. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Again, you, you see, we don't have to understand all that means in detail to see the position of prominence that the New Testament puts the apostles at. Now, I want to, I've got some, I want to read through quickly some verses that didn't make it to, to this slide. Think about this. One of the most vivid, one of the most, one of the most striking uh, illustrations of an apostle's authority is in Acts 5. You recall when Ananias and Sapphira, uh, kind of on the heels of the end of chapter 4, people, the, the disciples were in need, and people had lands and houses. They sold them and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's another indication of, of their position. Laid it at the apostles' feet, and they made distribution. Well, in chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira sell a piece of property. You know the story. 
The problem was they brought part of it to the apostles and said it was all of it. They lied. And Peter said, Peter, Peter confronts them. And Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to Ananias to lie to the Holy Spirit? He said, the, the, the lamb was yours. You, you didn't have to do anything with it. This was voluntary. You know, Jesus' church is not communism. We're not a, we're not a collect, collective that has to divorce ourselves of all our property and, and form one big pot. The Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, how, how in the world could the, even the command in the, in the Old and New Testaments, thou shalt not steal, how would that make any sense if I can't have any property that's mine? You couldn't steal it. But anyway, Peter said, why did Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then he said, you have not lied to men, but to God, which as an aside, we already know that the Holy Spirit's God, don't we? But here's a great proof text for that. Peter said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Uh, but, but Peter stopped talking and an house fell down dead, right? Just like that. A few hours later, his wife comes in, not knowing what happened. And we've already been told she's, she's uh, complicit in the whole thing. She was party to this whole cover-up. And Peter says, uh, Sapphira, did you, did you sell the property for such and such? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, the feet of the men who carried your husband out are at the door, and they'll carry you out too. And she fell down dead. Now, what, what normal human being can confront somebody like that? Know what they've done. Know, maybe read their mind. Have they been told by the Holy Spirit, I assume? And then when they're through talking, husband and wife fall down dead. An apostle, this is an apostle. In 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul said, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Paul said, when we talk to you, and we, we spoke God's word to you, we're humans, we're men, we're talking, we're teaching, we're preaching. You accepted it, not as the word of man. Why not? Paul's a man. He's up there speaking. He said, you didn't receive it that way. You, you received it for what it really is, the word of God. You believe, can't think about that. You have a man speaking. He didn't have a Bible that he handed them. He was speaking, he was teaching. And he said, this is God's word. And he said, you know what? You got it right. You accepted what I said as a human being, as the words of the living God. That's exactly what they are. You can't say that and be telling the truth unless you are speaking words that God, the Holy Spirit, has told you to speak. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul said, we have, com we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. You notice that language? We command. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life. Such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus to work in quiet fashion, eat their own bread. Who is this issuing commands? I thought God issued commands. Well, he does, but he's delegated to these men, these 12 and Paul. He's delegated to them authority to command. Acts 10, Peter is at Cornelius' house. Holy Spirit's fallen on, on Cornelius and his family, his people. And uh, it's been shown by that that God approves the Gentiles. And Peter said, he ordered them, he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. First Corinthians 14, Paul said. Again, think about the audacity. If somebody's lying about this, the commandments I'm telling you are by the authority of Jesus Christ. Now I can give you, I can, I can do what I'm doing now, and you can too, read scripture and say, this is the Lord's commandment. But that's not exactly what I'm talking about here. Again, Paul didn't have, he had an Old Testament. I'm not sure how many had access to it. He didn't have the New Testament, it's certainly not fully when he's doing this. And he said, I've given you commandments and they're by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then John, 1 John was an apostle, remember? John said, we are from God. 
He who knows God, listen to us. He who, who, he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Um, you see even there in that quick rundown, you, you see with the authority the apostles spoke. Uh, and they spoke it not because they were usurping authority, but they spoke it because Jesus had given them the authority and they had been, uh, they had been given this message by the Holy Spirit so that what they wrote and spoke was what God wanted written and spoken. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, I'm probably belaboring this, but again, when somebody talks about the Apostle Paul as being a kindergartner, we shouldn't be swayed by any of this. Uh, verse 16 through verse uh, 21, 1 Corinthians 4. Therefore, I exhort you to be imitators of me. For this reason, I have sent you to Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some, verse 18, some have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will, shall find out, not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Notice verse 21. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod? or with love and a spirit of gentleness. Who says that? Who can somebody say that? When I come, Paul said, should I, you, you, you tell me, should I come to you with a rod or with love and gentleness? Which is it gonna be? This is an apostle and he has a right to talk that way because he is an ambassador of, for Christ. Uh, we're gonna skip those because our time is, is running out. They were central, these central characters in, in the Jerusalem church. Acts 2.24, familiar passage, they continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles' teaching, breaking of bread and in prayer. We've already mentioned this verse, Acts 4, they laid their, uh, the sale price of their properties at the apostles' feet. In Acts 8 and verse 18, remember they had gone to Samaria, Philip had gone to Samaria, People had obeyed the gospel. Simon the sorcerer had obeyed the gospel. But they called for Peter and John. Why? Because they're apostles. Philip was not an apostle. And Simon saw with the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. When he saw that, he said, I, I want this gift. I, I'll pay you some money. I want this gift that I can lay hands on people and they'll get the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, <laughs> Your, 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 your silver and gold perish with you. You have no part of God in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Repent of your wickedness and pray God that the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. He goes on to say, I perceive you're in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. This is an apostle. But the point I'm making is the apostles were called down apparently because they were the only ones who could lay hands on somebody and transmit these gifts. Not the giving of the gifts. The apostles had the power to give the gifts but they could give the gifts to somebody else. Revelation 2.2, 2, Jesus says to the church, he said, uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy with you in that you have tried those who claimed they were apostles and you found out they weren't. Some people claiming to be apostles. They were not, they were only 12 and Paul. So when we read this, you could add to this list, just keep adding to it. Acts 27, the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, under the apostles' supervision. You recall, Paul was there, Acts 27. Paul preached till midnight on this occasion. But we need to take it seriously. Where else do we have a record that the early church met to eat the Lord's Supper? Where is it? It's here. I can't think of anywhere else. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul gives instructions about taking up a collection. In this case, it's for the poor saints. It's a voluntary gift by Christians. No raffles, no garage sales, no suppers, nothing else to sell to raise money. The, since this is an apostle of Jesus Christ, he said, here's the way you do it. And that's all we've got. Then we need to take it seriously. Why would we deviate and risk our souls by doing something an apostle of Jesus Christ under the Spirit's direction told us to do? Why would we deviate from that? In Acts 15, the apostles and elders, under the Spirit's direction, they said the old law is not binding on Gentiles. 
no apostle. And this is, this is some, kind of some old stuff, but at least it's not talked about much now. It used to be talked about all the time when I was growing up. But no apostle hinted at ball teams, human institutions, social events from the Lord's treasury, done work, there's this kind of work done by the Lord's church. There's nothing like that hinted at in scripture by the apostles. Again, we talked, you know, earlier we said, faith is the belief of testimony. To do something by faith, we have to have heard from God on it in Scripture. Scripture doesn't say anything about this. If we do it, we do it outside of faith. Can't, can't have faith and do that. Apostle says, sing and make melody, Ephesians 5, 19. Under their jurisdiction, not a trace of instrumental music in the early church. Again, how can we do it? How can we do that? By faith. The apostles have authority given by Jesus. When an apostle says, don't be deceived, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexual, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need to listen to that. Well, I said we'd come back to this. This is a, uh, a liberal New Testament scholar. And here's what he, at least is honest. He said, I think it's important to state clearly that we do, in fact, reject the straightforward commands of Scripture. That's clear enough. And appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. And what exactly is that authority? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to which tell us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. We'll stop there for a second. So he's, as he's honest, it, there's no confusion about homosexuality in the Bible or any of these other perversions. There's no, there's no adultery, fornication. There's no, there's no confusion. The scripture everywhere condemns it. So he's, he's, Frank in saying, we reject the straightforward commands of Scripture. What do you do when you do that? Well, he said, we appeal to another authority. What's that? Me. <laughs> Me and you. You do what you want. I do what I want. I reject God's commands. And I make my own standard. And so, we appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to which tell us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. You know, he's, he's almost, again, he's, how, how he can say this about God. Uh, it's like God made me this way so I can ignore his straightforward commands about putting this aside because God made me this way. But he commanded me not to do it. What uh, circular reasoning? Uh, I think I mentioned this the other day. Well, under this reasoning, why, why can't I say, uh, I'm a heterosexual man. Uh, I'm tempted, and I can be tempted, and am tempted. We're, men are tempted all the time uh, to commit fornication, adultery, uh, pornography, why don't I have the right to say, like he does, just the way God made me? God made me this way. If I have all kinds of uh, uh, sexual uh, liaisons, that's not my fault. It's the way God made me. Of course, I can say that, just, like, just as he can. The point is, of course, nobody can say it because God says, no, you can't do that. Jesus came to save us from that. And to, he loved us enough to, to show us that's not the way for true happiness, and it's certainly not the way that he made us to be. So continuing the quote, he said, by so doing, we explicitly reject as well the premises of the scriptural statements condemning homosexuality. We reject it. Namely, that it is a symptom of human corruption and disobedience to God's created order. I'll say, at least he's honest. It's clear, it's clear what God said. There's, there's no confusion. And people can take out, we mentioned there the other day, people can corrupt God's word by taking out the Apostle Paul's explicit condemnation of that in, in a Bible version. 
but it still stands. And the Bible is so integrated with its teaching that it's hard to take it all out, even if you tried to. It would be very hard to monkey with the text enough to take it all out. But even if we did, God's commands still stand. And uh, this, is, this is simply a frank acknowledgement of what's going on in the secular culture and the secular worldview. Um, I want to say something right before we end. I think that's the last slide I had. No, I didn't. Oh, okay, good. We'll hold that. Maybe some signs of sanity. And we'll, we'll come back to this at another session because there's some other people who made some admissions that may show some, some signs of sanity coming back, maybe. Uh, one million United Methodists exited in one day. In April and May, United Methodist Church held its general conference. This is a quote. Delegates removed the church's longtime stance that sex is only for marriage between husband and wife. Adultery and extramarital sex were removed as chargeable offenses for clergy along with homosexual behavior. This earlier this year, this is what they did. Again, scripture's clear. This is the United Methodist Church. And they said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to, we're going to reject that. U.S. progressives at the General Conference were celebratory about their huge victories, even as they approved massive budget cuts in reflecting United Methodist membership decline. Yet the church on the Ivory Coast, that's West Africa, voted on May the 28th to exit the denomination. Here's what they said. Reasons of conscience before God and His Word, the supreme authority in matters of faith and life. Think what about that. That's a, that's a magnificent statement. They said, we're, we're leaving this denomination for reasons of conscience before God and His Word, the supreme authority in matters of faith and life. That's exactly right. We can hope that they will pursue this line of reasoning and thinking and get even further along in their obedience to Christ, more fully, more fully taught, more fully changed. But this is a great start. So about a million left in one day. They said the United Methodist deviates from the Holy Scriptures and rather sacrifices its honor and integrity to honor the LGBTQ plus community. This Bishop uh, Benjamin Boni said, the United Methodist Church now rests on social economic values that have consumed its doctrinal and disciplinary integrity. And some predict that in five years, nearly all of Africa will have exited United Methodism. In the new age, this is a quote still, in the new age of post-denominational America, likely United Methodism with other denominations will not meaningfully exist as a national body in 10 years. I don't know if that's gonna be true or not, but as I say, what a sign of sanity that these, these uh, religious people in South Africa and in Africa, a million strong, made a statement and left this denomination. I think that's great news. Uh, hope you can be back Wednesday. <laughs>